Okay, and so um, we talked and have been talking about, I think my clicker, of course, is going to give me a hard time today. Of course, that's what this is going to do today of all days. It decides to do this for some reason, so we're just going to go ahead and advance them manually. <laughs> okay. All right, hang on, guys. I'm locked up here for some reason. Okay, here we go. Okay, so remember, we have been talking about the government-wide financial statements, and we've been talking, guys, class has started, okay? We've been talking about the government-wide financial statements. We've been talking about the fund financial statements. Now, when we talk about the government-wide statements, remember, we said that the government-wide statements are going to be a consolidated statement and we're going to consolidate the individual funds right so how many um, different funds do we have Two. try again we have well we have three categories but we have 11 different funds right so we have our governmental funds we have our fiduciary funds and we have our proprietary funds right okay and within there there are one, two, three, four, five governmental funds. How many proprietary funds? Good. There are two proprietary funds and then our fiduciary funds. Good. There's going to be four of those, right? And we'll look at the mnemonic for those here in a couple seconds. Okay. So five plus two is seven plus four is 11. And then what? We take some of these funds, not all of them, and we consolidate them into the government-wide statements, right? Okay, so that goes back to really chapter one as well. Okay, but we uh, looked at that. And when we look at our government-wide statements, remember we have what? The operational accountability. We have the economic resources flow, and we use the accrual basis of accounting. Again, accrual basis of accounting is what we've been studying in all of our accounting classes, right? We purchase, say, a piece of equipment like an asset. We debit equipment. We credit cash, whatever, and then we depreciate that asset, right? Just like we've been doing for a long, long time now in all of our accounting classes. But operational accountability, flow of economic resources, accrual, accrual basis of accounting. Okay, and I've got a slide at the end of this uh, chapter that's going to summarize the type of accounting, the measurement focus, and the accountability for all of our different uh, levels of reporting, government-wide, and fund financial statements. Now, we come down, and when we look at our fund financial statements, we say it is a separate set of accounts used to keep track of of resources and again remember I've gave, given the example that let's say the legislature decides that they're going to put a tax on gasoline and then they're going to use that tax on gasoline for road improvement right the in probably that case that would be a special revenue fund the revenue being the gas tax and that special revenue fund special purpose would be to make sure that the money is spent for what for road improvement and that would be the objectives of the funds okay so for those reasons then when we look at our governmental funds we can use something called modified accrual accounting and with modified accrual accounting remember if we purchase a piece of equipment i wrote in the journal entry over here last time we would debit expenditure and credit cash when we purchase that equipment remember i said pretend we bought a steamroller right big wheel that flattens the road bed. Can you use that sort of equipment to uh, affect road improvement? Yes, you can. So all we would have to demonstrate then is that we'd spent that money for the intended purpose road improvement. So we don't worry about capital maintenance. We simply do what? We simply would debit expenditure, credit cash. Okay. So if that's the case, we're only worried about short-term resources. We don't record fixed assets. We don't record long-term debt in our governmental funds. And we use what? We use fiscal accountability. Fiscal accountability meaning are we spending the money for the intended purpose, right? 
okay? Okay, good. Now, when we get to our proprietary funds and our fiduciary funds, we'll be back to full accrual accounting, economic resources measurement focus. So the only time we have to worry about this weird stuff, the modified accrual accounting, is what? When we are dealing with our governmental funds. And remember, one of the big objectives of this class is for us to understand key differences between modified accrual and full accrual. We've talked about one here, right, which is how we account for fixed assets, but there are also things that we're going to start talking about next time. For example, revenue recognition is different if we're talking about full accrual accounting, which we use at what the government Y level versus modified accrual accounting that we would use for our governmental funds. Okay. All right. Good. All this is review, guys. Okay. Now, what happens? This slide, I put all these stars on it. I mean, this is the slide that you need to sleep with under your pillow, right? Okay. This is the definitive slide that's going to help you with a bunch of questions. You'll see when we go through our practice midterm today, you've already seen it a little bit in chapter one, but you're really going to start to see it in the chapter two quiz. Okay. And so what do we've got? We've got the fund types going across the top, right? Our governmental funds, proprietary funds, our fiduciary funds, three categories. We've got the 11 funds, right? Okay. And so we have a mnemonic here that you can use to help you remember, grasp the general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund. Those are our five governmental funds, right? Two proprietary funds, internal service fund, the S in this mnemonic, and what? The enterprise, the E in this mnemonic. That spells C. I know C has two E's, but we're going to pronounce that C. Grass, C, and who are we going to see? We're going to see KIP. That's our fiduciary fund category. We've got what? We've got our custodial funds, our investment trust fund, our pension fund, and our private purpose trust fund. Uh, don't worry about the particular types of pension funds. Just remember KIP, okay? Um, and that's going to be our pension funds, okay? Now, I've also given you the type of accounting that are used in each one of these categories. So we've got the modified accrual basis of accounting, fiscal accountability, right? And therefore, and current financial resources measurement focus, and therefore, there are only what? Current items, there are no fixed assets, no long-term liabilities, right? Of course, when we get to what? When we get to our proprietary funds, our fiduciary funds, full accrual accounting, so we of course will have fixed assets, right? Okay, now, what do we do? We have our government-wide statements, which use operational accountability, full accrual basis, economic resources. And remember, we said that there's a consolidation from the funds to the government-wide. So we take all of our governmental funds, or general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, and consolidate it under the column governmental activities at the government-wide level, right? Then we take the internal service fund, which is a proprietary fund at the fund level, but we roll it into the governmental activities, right? And the reason we do that is because our customers of our internal, I mean, just think of the word internal service fund, are what? Entities inside the government, the other funds. For example, do cities own vehicles? Let's hope we don't have one behind us when we're trying to get home tonight, right? A police car is a what? Is a city-owned vehicle. And because these are fire trucks or city-owned vehicles, and because these are somewhat emergency-type vehicles, the city's going to want to make sure they're maintained at a high level. They don't want to take them over to Moe's Garage. So what do they do? They take them to an internal service fund where all city vehicles are worked on. So what happens? You can't drive your car in there. So all of the customers of the internal service fund are governmental funds. So we include that in the governmental activities column when we consolidate at the government-wide level. Then what? We take our enterprise funds, and the government could have several enterprise funds. We could have one, two, whatever. We take them and we consolidate them under the what? business type activity column. Now what happens? Now the customers of the uh, enterprise funds, say uh, city parking, say the water and sewer activity, most of those customers are what? Outside of the government. It's a charge for service type arrangement. And so those go under the business type activity. How about my fiduciary funds? Not reported. Where's KIPP? 
KIPP is not reported at the government-wide level because how well we manage and all the assets in the fiduciary fund category belong to somebody outside the government, right? For example, the pension assets don't belong to the government. It belongs to the employees of the government, right? So what we don't report them at the government-wide level under the operational accountability focus, how well you maintain assets for others has nothing to do with your economy efficiency at the operational accountability focus at the government-wide level. Okay, so pretty much stuff, you're not having deja vu, we've talked about all this, right? Okay, okay, good. We also talked about the basic financial reporting model required under Governmental Accounting Standards Board under GASB requirements, which includes what? The MDNA, includes the government-wide statements, the fund financial statements that we've been talking about, and the notes there too. Notes are always considered an integral part of the, and this is the basic, what's FS? Basic financial statements. Okay, so that's our basic financial statements. Let me just go ahead and put that S there. Basic financial statements, right? Okay, and then we have what? Required supplemental information other than MDNA. That means, therefore, that the MDNA is, by definition, must be what? Required supplemental information, as is, obviously, the required supplemental information other than MDNA. Okay, so when you look at this model, everything up here is either falling under the category of basic financial statements or required supplemental information. What does the word required mean? Have to have it. Supplemental means it does what? It adds to something else. So the required supplemental information, both the MDNA and the required supplemental information other than MDNA is simply adding to the financial statements. So the MDNA isn't saying what a beautiful city we have. It's explaining financial aspects. Why did we have to spend more money on public safety? Why did we spend less money on recreation, whatever, right? And it's a written prose document that will explain that. The required supplemental information other than MDNA might actually show, and we're going to take a look, by the way, some of that a little bit later, will actually, what, have a budget to actual comparison by line by line by different functions of the government, right? So it's obviously going to be more detailed. So we put the MDNA first because it's going to give us a high-level description of what's going on with the basic financial statements. Then here come the basic financial statements, the government-wide statements, the fund financial statements, and the notes there too. And then we'll have all this additional detail, which is going to give us stuff like tables, comparing budget to actual, etc. And I'm not going to repeat that, but remember, we went to the city of San Jose's comprehensive annual financial report, and we actually found all that stuff, right? Okay. Is, uh, who was the auditor? MGO was the auditor, okay, of that information. Okay, any question about this so far? No? Okay, good. Now, I'm not going to go back through everything that we said about the MDNA and stuff, but I do want to take a quick look, even though we looked at this last time, at the government-wide statements. Okay, and we have what? We have our statement of net position, our statement of activity. So we've got two government-wide statements. One is like the balance sheet, the statement of net position. The other is like the income statement, the statement of activities. And remember, we spent quite a bit of time understanding the way those statements work. Again, cru accrual basis of accounting, economic resources, measurement focus. It's what's used at the government-wide level, right? Now, when we look at the statement of net position, we all remember our favorite song, Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity is our favorite song, right? But when we report at the government-wide level, notice that we're taking the approach of assets minus liabilities equal stockholders' equity. Now, stockholders' equity in a government at the government-wide level is called net position, right? And net position is like retained earnings because governments don't sell stock and they don't have additional paid in capital. So we're pretty much down to what? Uh, Retain earnings as being the net, um, the like stockholders equity, the net position, and we report what all of our assets plus deferred outflows, 
all of our liabilities plus deferred inflows. And we talked a little bit about that last time. Uh, starting with Chapter 4, we're going to really start to dig into deferred inflows, deferred outflows more. And then what? The difference equals net position. Okay, that is different than what you see on the balance sheets you've been studying in commercial in which what? We show the total assets, we show the liabilities, we show the stockholders' equity, then we add the liabilities and stockholders' equity again so that it balances, right? So the balance sheet balances, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. When we're dealing with the government-wide, we don't do that. We just show the bottom line, which is net position, and we don't then total up the net position with the liabilities to show that it balances to the assets. Okay, so let's just look at, um, we'll, we talked about that last time. Like I said, we'll get into deferred outflows. But let's just look at a, an example of the statement of net position, okay? And we can see that we have what? We have our governmental activities. Our governmental activities are going to have our general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, GRASP, plus our internal service fund all get rolled in the governmental activities column, right? Then what? Then we have our business type activity, and that reports the activity of the primary government. Now I'm really going to challenge you. How do we know if we're a primary government? How do we know if we're a primary government? Well, everything we're talking about is state and local here. This is all state and local, right? Federal government accounting is not part of what uh, we talk about in this class. GASB doesn't cover state and local. So, I mean, <laughs> doesn't cover federal. They only cover state and local. Yes, sir. Did you put your hand up? Yeah. States are automatically primary governments, right? General purpose governments, very good, are automatically a primary government. What's a general purpose government? A city, a county is a general purpose because they have lots of activities, right? Cities have public safety function, but they also have recreation culture functions as well. So since they have several purposes, then they are automatically considered, they're a general purpose government, they're automatically considered a primary government. All the states are primary governments. So it's only what? Special purpose governments that potentially do not meet the requirements for being a primary government. What's a special purpose government? A government that has a singular purpose, like a school district. What's the singular purpose of a school district? I believe the children are the future. All that stuff, right? Okay, and so what happens? We have to, if we're a special purpose government, we have to look to see if we meet the criteria for a special purpose government to be a primary government, meaning we have to have what? A separately elected governing board. We have to be legally separate and fiscally independent. We have to meet all of those criteria in order to be a uh, primary government, right? If we do, then we'll prepare this information that you see in front of you. If we are not a primary government, what are we? We're a component unit and we will appear on the financial statement of the primary government to which they are financially accountable to us. So remember that drawing that you wanted to look at? You're like, oh, what's that? Where I had the primary government was the parent, the component unit was the child, right? And the child will, is children, are parents financially accountable to their children? Yes, they are. Try having one sometime and tell the government you're not financially accountable to them, okay? You are financially accountable to your children, so what happens? You are the component unit is financially accountable. The primary government is financially com, com, um, financially um, responsible for the component unit, so they show up on the financial statements of the primary government. This is a what? Columnar format. We call that discrete presentation, right? Okay. Where's my KIP funds? KIP is not reported, right? Okay, and since we're at the government-wide level, we're using full accrual accounting. Okay, all right, good. So we've got our assets, our liabilities, both current and non-current, guys. Full accrual accounting, right? Both current and non-current, full accrual accounting. Then we come down and we have our net position. And our net position is what? Reported separately, right? We don't roll it into the liabilities. Okay. Total assets were 8,493,000. Total liabilities, 474,763,000. And then what? Net position, 3,730,000. Remember, I added them together and they totaled to the assets. 
okay? But we don't do that math for you on the statement of net position, okay? Now, notice that our total net position for our business type activities here is 1,835,000, right? Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to be able to look down at the fund level, and right here I'm looking at just my proprietary funds. I'm looking at my um, uh, my two enterprise funds, my water and sewer, my parking facility. I don't include the internal service fund here because that's going to be in the governmental activities column, right? But I add these two enterprise funds together, and when I do, I get a total here of what? 1,835,000? Is that the same number? Okay, so we didn't lie that we take the enterprise funds and we do what? We roll them together and we report them at the government-wide level, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, you come over and, um, guys... I've discovered a small typo um, on the one that I had up last time, and so uh, you don't see this yet. I'm going to put this up on, on um, Canvas. Don't worry about it. It's just a small typo. Don't worry, okay? But it's not. It doesn't make a big deal of a difference, okay? Uh, but this is a little different from what you may have in front of you right now, just a small number difference, okay? But when you take a look, we have our governmental funds, right? We're sitting here with our governmental funds, okay? This is our governmental funds. So now we're down at the fund level for our governmental funds. We have the total governmental funds. Notice the total assets are 5,616,000 total assets, okay? Then what? Then we come over and when we report our liabilities plus our fund balance, notice we report 5,616,000. Okay, so it balances, doesn't it? Okay, the one that I took off didn't balance. And it's supposed to balance because assets equal liabilities plus, and our fund balance is like our stockholders' equity at the fund level, but we call it what? Fund balance, right? Okay, so when you look at my stockholder's equity, my fund balance, my like retain earnings for my governmental funds now, that's like RE, retain earnings is RE, that says like RE. When you look at the total fund balance, 4195000 you say, wait a minute, that does not tie to the what? to the total net position that was reported at the government-wide level. The total net position for governmental activities is 3730000 something. It doesn't tie, right? So what happens? Remember when we looked at the GASB reporting model, there was an arrow that went between the government-wide statements and the fund financial statements? That's telling governments that they have to provide a reconciliation that will show how we can tie the government-wide statements to the fund financial statements, okay? And this reconciliation is going to take this 4195000 and show how it reconciles to what? What we reported in that position at the government-wide level. Isn't that what this thing's doing? It's reconciling, explaining the difference, and right now we don't know enough about the differences between modified accrual and full accrual to fully understand this reconciliation, but we're going to be able to do this reconciliation after Chapter 8, after we've sat through and gone through fund by fund and understood some of the key differences, but we know enough right now to know that what? If we don't report fixed assets at the governmental fund level, and we do report them at what? government-wide level, then we would have to add our fixed assets to our fund balance to eventually get to what's in that position at the government-wide level, right? Okay. Question. Okay, good. We also talked about this scary slide, right? Oh, how am I supposed to understand this? This what? Statement of activities? Okay, this is like the income statement. So we have the statement in that position, government wide level. We have the statement of activities at the government wide level, right? Okay, and we talked about what? It wasn't that scary because when we looked at it, it was similar to what we saw for the balance sheet, governmental activities, business type activities. My general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, plus my internal service fund will be included under governmental activities. My enterprise funds will be under business type activities. 
Okay, so it's a very similar format in terms of grouping of the information into governmental and business type activities. And remember, this statement didn't get very far. It automatically started reporting expenses by various government programs. And we called out public safety. Does the government keep you safe? Okay, good. Sometimes I'm when people say no. If you're here right now, they kept you safe. Okay, if you don't make it home tonight, then they failed. Okay, but they try to keep you safe. So, public safety, 1025000 We have what? We have an allocation of any indirect expenses. And then we had program revenues. And program revenues are used to defray the charges of my, um, to defray the cost of my, um, of my programs, right? So even though they spent one million twenty-five thousand, ignoring the indirect cost allocation, one million twenty-five thousand on public safety, they get some money in to help pay for these. Okay, and we talked about what charge for services. They raised seventy-eight thousand. Remember, we said, well, how do you? charge for public safety. I mean, are the police going to people and saying, hey, if you want me to chase the criminals, it's going to cost you a little bit more and we can make them pay the ultimate price for a little extra. We had that whole discussion. Okay. And then we said, well, no, what happens if you want to, you know, hold a protest? I want easier exams at San Jose State. You start walking down the middle of the street with that protest. They'll say you need to disperse. This is an unlawful assembly, right? But if you go and apply for a permit first, they will protect your right to do that, right? And so what happens? That cost of that permit might be a charge for service that defrays some of the cost of the public safety program. Okay. Now we call that exchange revenue because what? You pay for the um you pay for the permit, you get the permit, you get the, protect, the protection, don't you? So that is what? That is an exchange. You get something back for what you pay for, right? Okay. Now, there were two more categories of program revenues. One was operating grants, one was capital grants. Now, this government didn't get any. They should have consulted with me because I could have told them about a program at the federal level that would provide some money for state and local police under the public safety function. It's called the COPS program. It's administered by the Department of Justice. And Department of Justice will give money to pay police salaries, for example. And if they were to pay, give money to pay police salaries, that would be an operating grant. They'll also give money to invest in capital items. For example, we mentioned they may provide funding so they can acquire equipment so they can tap into the CODIS database of DNA and fingerprints and all that so they can track down criminals, that sort of thing. That could be money that could come in under the public safety uh, capital grant. Okay, But whatever, they didn't get any here. So after they subtracted the, oh, don't forget, guys, um, Charge for service, I gave you S for that. Operating grants, capital grants, I gave you O and C. You're going to sock those away. Okay. Now, unlike our um, our charge for service, which is, which is an exchange revenue, operating grants and capital grants are considered what? Are considered non-exchange. They're considered non-exchange in that what? The higher level of government, say the federal government in our example, just gives them money and says, go, spend it. They don't sit there and say, hey, you know, we want to have the you know, police officers come and protect Washington, D.C. or something. There's no exchange there. They just give them the money, right? And our non-exchange um, uh, uh, money can either be considered a mandatory non-exchange or a voluntary non-exchange. Voluntary non-exchange is something like what I just described and that the lower level of government has to apply. They have to say, hey, we would like some of that COPS money. Here's what we're going to use it for. Department of Justice will go through and look at all the different applications. They only have so much money in the pot and they decide who the winners are, right? Okay, so that's considered voluntary because they are what? Applying for money under those programs. 
mandatory would be if the higher level of government tells the lower level of government, you need to take care of something. You need to do something. And the lower level of government says, well, how am I supposed to pay for it? And the higher level of government says, here's the money. Spend it on, say, cleaning up some sort of environmental problem, right? And states often will do this with counties because I can't have your county polluting my county. And so we have a state government that will what? Sort that out and say, okay, here's what some cleanup that has to happen in this county. Here's some cleanup that has to happen in that county. And here's the funding for that. Now sometimes local governments will complain because there are non-funded mandates. They tell them to do something and they don't give them the money to do it. Um, but uh, if they did, then we would be reporting that as a, a government mandated non-exchange. Okay? Now, we looked at this thing and what? Look at all these loser programs. Every one of these programs lost money. Look at that. Loser programs, right? So what do we have to pay for our loser programs? N no, this, we're not at the fund level. Okay, this is the government-wide level statements. So we're not even talking about fund level statements right now. We're talking about our government-wide statements that are a consolidation of all the fund level, right? Okay, so we have what? I think what you're thinking is general revenues, right? Okay, general revenues are what? taxes. Okay, So this statement of activities at the government-wide level is basically an upside-down income statement, isn't it? And the reason we present it that way is so that you can pick this up and you can see how my what? How my taxes are paying for these various programs, right? And so this government had a little bit of money left over. We call that change in net position. Just like we could call retained earnings change in return to earnings um, we could call net income, I should say, change in retained earnings if we got rid of dividends, right? But we have dividends, so we don't call our net income, and we have different objectives in, in commercial accounting. But if we only had net income, we could call retained earnings change in, we could call net income change in retained earnings, right? Okay, but here we call our net income, our like net income change in net position. So this government had a little money left over, right? And remember, I said, somebody stood up in one of my classes one time and said, the government owes a refund for that. Okay, whatever your feelings are about it, I just want you to know that it's what? It's what's left over, right? And whether they decide to refund it or not is a whole other policy issue. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to go through the detail here, guys. We went through this last time. These several slides here take what we saw on that example and put it into different bullet points on the slides, right? Okay, I'm not going to repeat all that. Okay, then we talked about the government, uh, the fund financial statements, and I told you that these names of these statements are in red because you have to know the names of the statements. You must know the names of the statements, okay? Our general fund, pre our, our governmental funds, with which the general fund is one of them, our governmental funds prepare two statements, a balance sheet, which is like a balance sheet, and a statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance, which is like a income statement, right? Our proprietary funds are the only fund category that prepare three financial statements, a statement of net position, which is like the balance sheet, a statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position, which is like the income statement. And then our statement of cash flows is only prepared. The only statement of cash flows you see in all the government financial reporting model is only in our um, proprietary fund category. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, but we'll really jump into it in Chapter 7. Okay, and then we have what two fiduciary fund statements, a balance sheet and income statement. The balance sheet is called the statement of fiduciary net position. The income statement is called the statement of changes in fiduciary net position. Do you have to know the names of these statements? You have to know the names of these statements. Okay, and then we went ahead and started talking about the general fund. And just a reminder, guys, at this point, we are at a very high level, aren't we? We're just looking at the structure of these statements is what we've been doing so far, okay? And so we started looking at the structure of the governmental fund, and we started with the 
Again, current financial resources, measurement focus, modified accrual, uh, basis of accounting. There are no long-term items, no capital assets, no long-term liabilities. Okay, And when we look at the structure of the balance sheet for our governmental funds, now we go back to a format that you see in commercial, which is assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. So now we do what? We total our assets. We take our liabilities plus our fund balance. Fund balance is like retained earnings. It's like our stockholders' equity. And we do gross that up and report that so that it can be balanced to the assets. Okay? We only use that format for the governmental funds. Everybody else uses the difference approach that we looked at for the government-wide statements. So the government-wide statements do it, the proprietary fund statements do it with the difference, and the what? And the fiduciary funds report that difference. Only the general fund reports the gross up here. That's only done in the general fund. Okay. Okay, or not, I shouldn't say general fund, but governmental funds. So once again, just to look at that again, total assets, 5,616,000, our total governmental funds. Then we take our liabilities, we add it to our fund balance, and we report up that gross up, right? We saw this statement earlier. Again, we have to do the reconciliation. I've already shown you. I've shown you the idea of the reconciliation. We're going to have to understand some of the details here a little bit later as we move through the rest of the chapters. Okay, we talked about the different categories of fund balance, guys. I'm not going to uh, repeat that. Okay. So I think this is where we left off, okay, because we talked about the structure of the balance sheet for our governmental funds. Now we're going to talk about the structure of the income statement, which we call the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changing fund balance, right? Okay. All right. Now, go ahead and let's do a quick little review of, uh, I don't have to put it up. I'll put it up anyway. I forgot we have these two little sideboards now. Um, so let's do a quick little review of uh, income statement for commercial accounting. Business 20. So uh, if I prepare a multiple step income statement, I think I'm shrinking. I used to be able to reach up here easier. Okay, multiple step income statement. Okay, uh, what should we first? Re what should we report first? Revenue, sales. Let's do sales. Good. Then what? Good. Cost of goods sold. Then we would subtract our sales from our cost of goods sold, and we call that what? Gross profit, gross margin, synonymous terms. Okay, good. Then what do we report? Operating expenses. We'll just use a large category, operating expenses. I don't want to, you know, salaries. Uh, utilities, right, administrative expenses, but we don't want to sit here and list all those, so let's just call them operating expenses, okay? So then we're going to go ahead and put our operating expenses, and so we will, what, subtract our operating expenses from our gross profit, and what will we call this line? We call this operating income, right? Huh? Somebody say no. You talking to me? Okay. We'll call this operating income. Okay, good. Now what? We could have what? Non-operating items, couldn't we? Okay. And so we would want to break those out separately because investors like to see what our bread and butter is, right? And often they'll do an analysis of operating income year over year because these non-operating things can kind of come and go, can't they? Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll have a section 
of non-operating items. And these non-operating items could be things like interest expense, for example. Now, if I'm a bank, what? Interest expense is probably an operating item, right? Okay, but a manufacturer, we probably put that down in the non-operating section, interest expense, okay? Uh, what, gains and losses on sale of equipment, right? I mean, when you go to Nordstrom and you buy a pair of shoes, they don't sit there and say, oh, those are very nice shoes. Would you like a cash register with that today? Okay, so it's not their day-to-day -to, -day to sell cash registers, but they might sell them. Okay, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a cashier because it looked so cool because they had to sit there and pump all the numbers in and had to look and knew what they were doing. Now they go what? Beep, beep, beep. Did you see who run on The Bachelor last night? Beep. They're not paying attention because it's automatically scanned, right? Okay. So when they went from the these kind of calculators to the bleep ones, they probably sold all the old cash registers, didn't they? Okay, so they maybe do that once every 10 years or something. And so we're going to put that as a non-operating item because it could come and go, right? Okay, so we might have gains and losses on sale of equipment, whatever. And so then we go ahead and we report what? Good, our bottom line net income. Good, good job, guys. Who was your business 20 teacher? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. That's what I thought. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Good. Don't make me come back there. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So we come over and um, let's go ahead. Now, let's put the uh, screen back. I didn't have to put it down. Okay. And when you look at this slide now, guys, we're going to use by analogy what we learned here or what we reviewed here for the commercial version of the income statement, right? Now we're talking about the government tool fund uh, income statement, which we call the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance, right? And we're going to have revenues and we're going to have expenditures. Revenues and expenditures are what? Operating type items, aren't they? Things that governments do every day, okay? Those are going to be revenue and expenditures. Retain earnings is like fund balance, isn't it? Is retain earnings like fund, um, is fund balance like retain earnings? Fund balance is like retain earnings, isn't it? So that means that what? Revenues will increase fund balance, just like revenues increase retain earnings, don't they? Okay. Expenditures will do what? Decrease fund balance, just like expenses decrease retain earnings, right? With me so far. So we've got revenues, we've got expenditures. Then we have what? Then we have things that are like non-operating items. And the non-operating items are going to be other financing sources and other financing uses. Other financing sources are like non-operating revenue. Like if you do what? If you sell equipment at a gain, Okay, these are non-operating revenues. Do non-operating revenues increase retain earnings? De depends on what. If it's a revenue, it's going to increase retain earnings, right? Okay, I know. Oh, you're thinking if it was a loss, we would that would be yeah. Well, gains and losses, we don't call them revenues and expenses generally. So you're right, see what you're saying. But if we're calling it a non-operating revenue, like like an interest revenue, it's going to do what? It's going to increase my retained earnings. Therefore, other financing sources, which are like non-operating revenues, are going to do what? Increase fund balance, aren't they? Okay. And are what? Other financing uses, okay, over here, are like non-operating expenses. So non-operating expenses would decrease retained earnings. Therefore, other financing uses do what? Decrease fund balance, right? Okay. Okay, now don't panic. Look right here. Revenues, expenses, right? Okay. Then we're going to continue on with our governmental income statement, our statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. We're going to continue on, and we're going to have sort of a non-operating section, aren't we? And in that non-operating section, there are other financing sources, 
there are other financing uses. That's all that's going on here. Other financing sources, other financing uses. We have what? We have other financing sources or like non-operating revenue. So they increase fund balance. Other financing sources, I mean. Other financing sources are what? Like non-operating revenue, they increase fund balance. Other financing uses are like what? Non-operating expenses, they decrease fund balance. That's it, guys. Don't overthink that. Okay, we're just using different terminology for what? For our, our non-operating revenues, our non-operating expenses, are we? We call them other financing sources and uses. With me so far? Okay, now, there are only two other financing sources. There are only two other financing sources. Two things that could be considered another financing source. Only two transactions that can happen that would be considered other financing source. Only two. One is if we issue long-term debt. Do we report long-term bond payable, for example, on our governmental fund balance sheet? We don't have any long-term items, do we? So what are we going to do if we issue debt? Governments issue debt, don't they? What would we do if we issued bonds or notes or something? Well, the cash part is easy. We have to debit cash and we would credit. That's a like a non-operating revenue. It's money coming in, isn't it? So we would credit other financing sources, bond proceeds, so that we're showing that we have a non-operating type revenue, don't we? We debit the cash, credit other financing sources, bond proceeds. It's like a non-operating revenue. We got to credit it, don't we? Okay. The other other financing uh, source is going to be when one fund transfers money to another fund. If one fund transfers money to another fund, then the receiving fund is going to get cash, aren't they? Okay, the receiving fund is going to get cash, so they'll debit cash. They'll credit other financing sources, transfer in, because it's like a non-operating revenue. We have to credit it, don't we? Money came in? Okay. So two other financing sources. What? Money comes in from issuance of debt. We don't have any long-term debt, so what are we going to do? We're going to credit the other financing source account, right? Or what? Transfers in from one fund to another. If that's the case, then what? Money comes into the receiving fund. That's like a non-operating revenue. Credit other financing sources transfer in for that. Okay. Now that's our other financing sources. There's just two of them. There is only one other financing use. One. And that's the what? Transfer out. The fund that is sending the money to the other fund is going to credit cash as money comes out, and they will debit other financing uses, transfer out, because what? They have like a non-operating expense, don't they? Because they've transferred money to another fund. Okay? So let's just go ahead. I think I'm going to go ahead and put the screen back up because I'm not sure if you can see on the sides if I write on one side or the other. So um, let me put the screen back up for a second. And let's just use an example of transfers between two funds. Okay. So remember the example that we gave where we said we had to do some sort of environmental study? and the capital project fund was left with a $30,000 bill, and the bond covenant said that they couldn't spend the money on soft costs like an environmental study, so the general fund was going to pass $30,000 over. Remember we talked about that? Okay. So don't worry if you don't remember that. So let's say, for whatever reason, the general fund is going to send $30,000 to the capital project fund. Okay. So in the capital project fund, CPF, Capital Project Fund, that's a P. Say it again. That's right, because we're not going to mess you up that much in this class, right? If cash is coming in, you debit cash, okay? That's just, you can count on that, okay? So cash comes in, so we go ahead and we do what? Debit the cash for 30000 right? Good. What are we going to credit? We're going to credit other financing sources, OFS. I'm just abbreviating other financing sources, OFS. And that's right, sir. It's going to be what? Transfer in? 30000 Is that going to increase fund balance? 
that's going to increase fund balance because it's like a non-operating revenue, right? It's going, it's another financing source. Okay, good. Now what happens? In the general fund, money's going out, isn't it? Because we're spending that money, we're sending that money from the general fund to the capital project fund. So we know we got a credit cash for 30000 And the general fund is going to, and I always feel funny because I abbreviate that, OFU, and everybody's like, OFU, John, I don't understand what the hell you're talking about, okay? Okay, other financing uses now is going to what? Is going to be a transfer out? For 30000 That's it. Two other financing sources, what? The transfer in, when money comes in for long-term debt proceeds. That's it. Two other financing sources. How many other financing uses? One when what? Money is transferred out. That's it, guys. Don't overthink this. Okay? Now, when we prepare our uh, question, now when we prepare our statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Let's just take a look at it for our governmental funds. Don't worry about all this right here. Let's look at the statement. General fund is one of our governmental funds, isn't it? Okay, and we have what? We have revenues, we have expenditures, don't we? We have revenues, we have expenditures. The difference between revenues and expenditures is called Operating income over here, isn't it? Sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. I know I'm scary, but my bark is worse than my my bite is worse than my bark. No, my bark is worse than my bite. Operating income, right, is sitting here as the difference between revenue and expenses essentially. In government, we don't call it operating revenue, we call it excess or deficiency of revenue over expenditures. We get paid by the word as government employees, okay? So instead of calling it operating income, we call it excess of revenue over expenditures. That's like operating income though, isn't it? L-I-K-E, operating revenue. I mean, uh, yeah, operating income, I should say. So we don't call it operating income, we call it excess of revenues over expenditures. That's like operating revenue, Ex operating income. It's like operating income. Okay, okay, good. Now, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. Just like we kept going over here. And when we kept going over here, we went to the non-operating section, didn't we? So by definition, what are we going to see next? other financing sources and uses. I know without having to click this, I know, right? Okay, so what happens? We come over, other financing sources and uses. There are two other financing sources, bond proceeds and transfers in. There is one other financing use, which is what? Transfers out, and those show at the bottom just like we showed the non-operating items at the bottom here, right? So after we consider our non-operating items, we have what? Change in fund balance. Change in fund balance is like net income. Fund balance is like retained earnings, isn't it? Okay. Question. All right, good. Now, we have our governmental funds, general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund. That little A is and so that you remember it spells grass. That's how we pronounce it. Okay, there is no A fund. One time somebody got mad at me and said, you haven't explained the A fund to us. It stands for and, okay? This is the and, okay? Now what happens? We have our funds and we're going to put labels on our expenses. Now, 
Gasby does not get up in the government's face and say, you must always use these labels for expenses under these circumstances. They give them a listing of labels, and governments can choose to use these however they decide to display information on their statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. So we will see functions or programs on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. Programs are things governments do. Do governments keep you safe? They try. So public safety is a program, isn't it? Okay. So if we go back to our statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance, there's a program called public safety. Now, we also saw that program, what? At the government-wide level, didn't we, on the statement of activities? But remember, the government-wide statements are simply consolidation of what we're seeing at the fund level, which is what we're looking at here. So it shouldn't surprise us that we have a similar line item here, right? The same line item, essentially. Okay? Public safety. Okay, good. Then what? Then we come over and we have organizational units. Now, you don't call out an organizational unit on your financial reports, but we want to understand the term organizational units. Okay? Organizational units are entities that achieve the objectives. So... Fire and police would be examples of what? Organizational units that achieve the objective public safety. Okay. Now, you have various activities that help achieve those objectives. For example, you have building inspection. Maybe the fire department comes and inspects. I guess we're not required to have sprinklers. Okay, but we have a lighted what? Exit, don't we? So they would look for those sorts of things. Okay. Sometimes when they look for the sprinklers, whatever, in these buildings, they find out that the contractors cut costs and they put the sprinkler heads but didn't do any of the plumbing. Okay. <laughs> so things like that, okay, is what they would be looking for in building inspection. And that's an activity carried out by the organizational unit, fire department under what? Under the public safety function, right? Okay. And then we can have a character label on our expenses. The character label on the expenses tells us whether it's going to benefit the current period or future periods. Okay. If an expenditure has the label current on it, it's going to benefit what period? The current period. If it has a label on it, uh, capital expenditure... Okay, now notice capital items, still an expenditure, right? But we can put a label on there so that people know, hey, we invest in some we think is going to last a few years, right? Okay, or we put, could put the label debt service. Now, unlike the federal government who borrows money to operate, many state and local governments are a little bit more responsible. And if they borrow money, they're matching that with something that is going to be a longer term asset. Okay, so if that's the case, we have debt service, interest in principal on debt service, then we're going to consider that a what? Well, it's a going to benefit future periods, right? But we would put the label debt service on there. Okay, then we could have a object class. Object class labels on our um, expenses tell us is, is sort of like a chart of accounts. So is salaries on a chart of account? Utilities is on a chart of account, so it's calling out some level of detail, right? Okay, so these are the different labels we can put on our expenses. So let's just go back for a second and let's just look at our expenditures here for our, uh, our governmental funds. We have public safety, the function, right? But notice for all of our functions, all of our programs, we are saying current. So these are being spent on the current period, aren't they? See current, we have that um, we have that character designation current, see current right there. Okay. So we're essentially saying, hey, these amounts that we're reporting under this heading current are going to benefit the current period, right? Then we come down and we start giving what? The object class debt service and the object ah, not object class. The what? The character debt service and the character what? capital outlay, that's telling people, hey, this money we spent is going to benefit future periods, isn't it? Okay. And then within that, we start using an object class. We tell you, hey, this was spent on principal, this was spent on interest. 
Okay, so the government has the option as to how they would array this information. This is but one example of how we might use those labels on our expenses. Okay, for our purposes, we are going to understand what this example. Okay, for our governmental funds, we have functions. That's things that governments do. Public safety is an example of a function, right? We have what? We have organizational UN unit, fire and police department. We have the organization unit carrying out activities such as building inspection. Uh, I have a friend that he's retired now, used to work for San Jose Police, and sometimes we'd be hanging out on a Sunday watching football or something, and he'd go, oh. I'm like, what? What's the problem? He's like, I got to go. I got to do patrols tomorrow. What's patrols? He has to go to all the kind of, you know, dumpy motels around town and run the, pli the license plate numbers. And if a hit comes up that this person's a problem, now he has to go figure out what room they're in. And then he's got to knock on the door. And he's got a scary knock. When he shows up in my house to watch football, I'm like, ah, the police are at the door. Okay, so what happens? That's an activity being carried out by the police department, right? So again, activities are uh, things that the organizational units do, right? Under the functions? Question? Uh, you know, like a more distinct, so say, say for example, like mechanics who pay for all the police cars and stuff, will they be under public safety since they're helping? Uh, well, they're, remember, we're looking at the governmental funds, okay? So they would not be a governmental fund, they're a proprietary fund. But, hang on, but when you get to the, um, um, when you get to the government wide level, now we're going to roll them into the governmental activities. And yes, now money that's spent by them very well, if for whatever time they spent tracking, uh, paying for, uh, you know, working on police cars, because they might work on city taxi cabs or something too. That's not going to be public safety, right? Well, actually, taxi cab probably going to be. Uh, enterprise fund anyway but again you know depending on what they worked on if they worked on police car yeah then that could be at the government wide level under the category public safety that's right and then we may even go and do a character designation in which we're going to say what character that's probably going to be a current item expenditure right whereas if the um, internal service fund bought you know um, you know, one of those things that they lift the car up, a piece of equipment, that might be under what? That might be under pu public safety. They might call it under public safety, but they might call it then the character outlay uh, um, for uh, future expenses, right? Future benefits. Okay. And then what? Character, which I just mentioned, current or future. And then what? Salaries. Okay. And again, we look at this, this is, don't worry about that other stuff, guys. Just remember the example. But when we look at this, where did my statement go? I'm going the wrong way. When we look at this, this is what? These are just suggestions as to labels. All you need to understand is the definition of the labels. You don't have to say, well, you always have to use this, or you never use that under these circumstances. Just know the examples. Okay? Question. Okay, good. Don't worry about these definitions. Okay, these definitions. I read through these definitions. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Okay, but I put those in there um, so that you can uh, so that you can see them. But don't. I wouldn't worry. I'd use the examples. Okay, now in your textbook, okay, um, the author makes a statement that I don't agree with. In the textbook, the author says that governments will eventually adopt a dual track accounting system in which they will record things at the fund level in the fund general ledger and they will simultaneously record things at the government wide level in the government wide general ledger. That is a mess. Because at the end, they have to consolidate these, don't they? And if you sit there and you have one system keeping track of journal entries and another system keeping track of journal entries, I'm here to tell you that will not work. That will not reconcile at the end. And if you don't believe me, look at the financial report of the federal government, which tries that. The federal government has one government-wide system, and then they have 32 separate agency systems. And guess what? 
they can't ever figure out the difference. So they end up plugging about $4 trillion on the financial report of the federal government every year because they can't get the two systems to talk to each other. That's why they always get a disclaimer of opinion. Remember we talked about that? Because my office, the GAO, has a problem with a $4 trillion plug okay, on the financial statements. Okay, so they end up disclaiming an opinion. Yes, sir. What do they plug in $4 trillion to? Net position. They just plug it to net position to make the balance sheet balance. And the reason the balance sheet d doesn't balance is they can't figure out all the little things that add up to $4 trillion that are differences between this one system, this one general ledger, and what? The 32 separate agencies' general ledgers. Okay, So for that reason, um, state and local governments, state and local governments could not live with a disclaimer on their financial reports. That won't happen. If they get a disclaimer on their financial reports, they're not going to be able to issue their debt. Okay, So unlike in the case of the federal government, they can issue debt no matter what happens. No matter how much of a deficit, no matter how much the debt, no matter how much their financial reports don't balance, no matter how much they get disclaimer on their opinions, people line up to buy their securities. Right? Every Tuesday, they bid on them. Every Thursday, they purchase them. Okay? To the tune of what? We talked about this last time, the tune of tw now $20 trillion, over $20 trillion of debt, right? So for the federal government, I guess because they run the Army and the Navy, right? So you go, okay, if you want my money here, take it, right? Okay, whereas what? For the state and local governments, they don't have that luxury. So their financial reports better balance, and they better not end up with a disclaimer on their financial reports, right? Or no one's going to buy their debt, okay? And so what happens? They record everything at the fund level. So everything gets reported at the fund level first. Okay? And then they're going to do like most responsible organizations do. They're going to take the individual pieces and they're going to perform a consolidation to get to the government-wide level, aren't they? Isn't that what you learned in advanced accounting? Company A, company B under common ownership. Take the two companies do the eliminating entries, you get a set of consolidated statements, right? Unlike uh, corporations, the government actually shows you the detail of the uh, aggregate pieces, right? Whereas a corporation will only report certain segment information to you, okay? All right, but let's just go ahead and let's just use an example, okay? So let's say I have my general, you don't have to write this down, guys. I'm, I'm not going to ever, I'm, we are, I'm not holding you accountable in this class for performing a consolidation to turn individual fund statements into government wide. So don't, don't freak out, okay? I'm just showing you why the comment in the book is not correct, okay? And how governments would actually do this, okay? And I'll see if I can get, uh, I don't know if they'll have time to do it this time of year. They might. It'd be nice if one of the CPA firms that audits the city of San Jose, MGO, could come in and show us an example, give us a, a more detailed presentation of how they do this, okay? But I won't hold you accountable of this. But anyway, in the general fund, let's say I have cash of, um, what was the number on that journal entry? Was it 40000 or 400000 huh? 400000 So let's say I have cash of 400000 I have no liabilities, so my fund balance is how much? Good, 400000 Okay, good. Now, I purchase a piece of equipment. So they're going to record this entry at the what? At the fund level, aren't they? So if I buy a piece of equipment for $400,000, what journal entry will I make? We call it expenditure. That's right expenditure for $400,000. I'll debit that and I'll credit cash, won't I? Okay. Now, let's say this was the only transaction that was made in this government. They had $400,000 cash. They spent on a piece of equipment. Okay. So now I'm going to do my closing entries, right? And when I do my closing entries, I'm going to credit expenditure. Guys, make sure you understand, not just in this class, in all your classes, the relationship between your 
stockholders equity between your balance sheet and your income statement. A weakness that I see in my students at all levels, I'm talking about CPA exam students as well, is a lack of understanding as to how the income statement closes out to the balance sheet. Because the balance sheet doesn't balance until we do our closing entries again, right? Okay, so make sure you understand that. So if fund balance is like retained earnings, then um, then what's my uh, what's my debit here? My debit is to fund balance for four hundred thousand because I would close that out to retain earnings, wouldn't I? We don't have income summary because we don't have income. Okay, so just go straight to fund balance, debit fund balance, credit expenditure. That closes the expenditure, right? You got to turn all your income statement accounts back to zero at the end of each year, don't you? Okay. Okay, good. So fund balance was sitting here, and it was a credit of four hundred thousand, and I debit it for four hundred thousand. How much is in there now? Zero is what's left in fund balance, right? Okay. So when I prepare my general fund balance sheet after that, my general fund balance sheet got what? How much cash do I have? Okay, I started with 400000 and I spent it on equipment, right? So I have cash of how much? Zero. I have fund balance of what? Zero, don't I? Now, I want to convert this to a set of government-wide statements. I've recorded everything at the fund level, but now I need to do what? Convert this, So, and I'll report both levels, but to get to the government-wide level, I'm going to have to convert this, right? Okay, guys, look, if you come to class and you miss a couple classes and stuff, you can't then come to the third class and sleep through the whole thing, okay? And if you're looking, if I'm looking at you, you're not the one, okay? So you got to stay awake, okay? This stuff, if you sleep during the class, here's what happens. You don't pay, appropriate, give appropriate attention to the information, but you don't give appropriate attention to your sleep because you're sitting there having a nice dream saying, oh, this is a beautiful place. I'm having a picnic with a beautiful person. And the whole time there's some dude up in a tree going, then we got fun balance. Okay, so don't, you know, stay awake, you know, so that you can follow this. Okay, so we've got what? We've got our general fund is zero. Our, uh, ca our cash in our general fund is zero. Our fund balance is zero, isn't it? Okay, so what we do is like you would do in any consolidation. You prepare a worksheet. And on that worksheet, you say, my dream is to have an account called equipment. Just like if you're doing a consolidation, you say, my dream would be to have an account called goodwill. My dream is to have an account called net position, isn't it? And I would go ahead and do what? I would, um, I would do what? On the worksheet, debits and credits. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to do what? Debit equipment. And I'm going to have to sit there and credit. And I'm not showing, I didn't show you the income statement down here. The statement of revenues, expenditures, and change of fund balance. I'm going to abbreviate it. That is it. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate that as income statement. My dream is to get rid of that expenditure of $1,000, right? I'd do this before closing. So I would go ahead and credit expenditure, not $100,000, but $400,000. I would credit expenditure $400,000. And then I can come over, and now I have what? On my government-wide statements, do I have equipment now? Do I have equipment now? I have equipment of what? 400000 because I just created this account equipment over here. I know it doesn't line up very well. I have what? I have equipment of 400000 don't I? By debiting equipment. I got rid of the expenditure, so now on my statement of activities, expenditure says zero, right? And so my what? There's no liability, so my um, equipment minus no liabilities leaves me what? A net position of how much? 400000 Okay. This is just one of many 
entries that they would perform to do what? To convert fund financial statements to what? To a set of government-wide statements, and there'd be a full-blown worksheet that would allow them to do that. Okay. Now, the most important thing for our purposes here is that we understand okay, that we understand how to record transactions if they were going to be reported at the government Y level versus the fund level. Okay, this is how I will test you. So if I'm acquiring equipment and I'm reporting that in the general fund, I debit expenditure, I credit cash, don't I? Yeah. Right here, guys. Okay. If I purchase equipment, I debit expenditure, I credit cash. If I was trying to report that at the government-wide level, what would be the journal entry? Well, I'm not, I'm, not t I'm not testing you on the converting entries. I would just want you to know you go directly to what? Building equipment, whatever it is. You debit building your credit cash. Okay, so that's the way I'm going to test you. I'm going to test you. How would you record the entry if you're trying to record it directly at the fund level versus the government-wide level? Okay? I just do that other piece so that you don't fall into this trap of thinking, oh, okay, there's two general ledgers. There are not. There's one general ledger, fund level. You make those converting entries, right? But the way we're going to study is what's the entry if you're trying to report something at the fund level? What's the entry if you're trying to report at the government-wide level, right? Okay? Do you have long-term debt at the government-wide level? You do not. So what would happen? We would... If we're at the fund level, long-term debt, we debit cash, we credit other financing sources, one of our two other financing sources, long-term debt, okay? If I'm reporting that at the government-wide level, what do I do? Full accrual accounting, government-wide level, what do I do? Full accrual accounting. Full accrual accounting at the government-wide level. This is at the fund level, other financing sources. Full accrual accounting. You know, I'm going to say it one more time. Full accrual accounting. What entry do you make when you borrow money? Debit cash and credit the no payable, right? Okay. I wasn't, I wasn't feeling it. I heard all kinds of things. It's like debit cash. And you're like, what are you doing accrual? I'm like, wait. I'm like, oh. Full accrual accounting, credit to no payable, right? If you're recording at the fund, at the, ah, the government wide level. Okay. Question. Okay. So what we're going to do is take a quick break and come back and uh, finish up the slides for chapter two. Okay. All right, guys. Yes. Uh, when, when we get into the other chapters, we're going to really start. Okay, good. So let's go ahead. And um, what we're going to quickly do here is just quickly, quickly, briefly, briefly talk about the activity of the different funds because we're going to get into each of the funds in the respective chapters, right? If we get into Chapter 3, 4, we'll be talking General Fund, Chapter 5, Capital Project Fund, and so on, okay? So just briefly... General fund, there's only one. It accounts for any activity that isn't counted for in another fund. So it has what? It has a general purpose. That's the term general fund. Okay. Our what? Special revenue fund. Here's the road. The what? The gas tax is the special revenue. We have to spend it on road improvement. It's the nature of the type of things that would be in our special revenue fund. Okay. Debt service fund is a cute little fund because it has a name tag that says exactly what it does. What do you do, little fund? I service the debt. What does that mean? It pays the principal and interest on the debt. Okay? Okay, good. Capital project fund, if we're going to be constructing, say, a county courthouse, we will accumulate those resources in the capital project fund. We will send them, spend them out of the capital project fund as we build that county courthouse, whatever, right? Okay, 
permanent fund, um, let me give you an example. Let's say the great-granddaughter of Bill Haywards. Who's Bill Haywards? No, if, when Bill Haywards was alive, nobody was a billionaire. Bill Haywards. Are you referring to Bill Clinton? No, I'm referring to Bill Haywards. Yeah, he's the guy who Hayward is named after. Okay, so Hayward comes to California during the gold rush. He's going to sell shoes to miners. When I mean miners, I don't mean people under 18. Okay, and I have to make that distinction because when I was a kid, and what I'm about to tell you was based on this book that I checked out of the library when I was 10. Um, I was reading that book, and I'm telling my sister, who's five years older than me, did you know that Bill Haywards came to California to sell shoes to miners? And my sister said, why wouldn't they sell shoes to miners? Miners, gold miners, okay? All right, so he comes, and he squats on land that belongs to Guillermo Castro. You ever heard of Castro Valley? Castro Valley, that land belongs to Guillermo Castro, and there were various squatters, Hayward squats. Every now and then, Guillermo would ride around on his horseback, or I guess in those days they didn't have pickup trucks, so he drives around, he rides around the horse and would scare the people off of the land, right? When he tries to do that with Hayward, Hayward is a shoemaker, so he gives him a pair of boots. So Castro says, okay, you know, you supplied me with some boots every now and then. You could stay on the land, okay? So it turns out that Guillermo Castro likes to gamble. So he needs to liquidate quickly. So he sells some property to Hayward that ends up being where Hayward puts his hotel, Hayward Hotel. Then Hayward gets on the Alameda County Planning Commission. And in those days, Hayward was like a resort town. If you're going from, say, Berkeley to San Jose, you stop in Hayward, enjoy a couple of days in Hayward, change your horses, keep going to San Jose. So he has this hotel, and now all the roads, after he gets on the Alameda County Planning Commission, seem to go right to his hotel. So he's successful. So at some point in time, they decide to name the town after him. Okay? If you wanted this story to be interesting... Just keep in mind this is an accounting class, okay? So what happened? So we go ahead, and the great great granddaughter of Bill Haywards comes and says to the city of Hayward, "I would like to have a park erected with a statue erected of my grandfather, my great grandfather, telling his life story, etc." Right? And let's say the city of Hayward says, "Sorry, we don't have money to run such a park." She says, "No problem. Here's a million dollars." Keep the principal, the million dollars, hold on to that forever, but you can use the interest to run the park. Any investment earnings, any interest, et cetera, you can use to run the park. Okay? So when you think about the permanent fund, guys, it's a very easy fund to understand its activity and that what? The name of it tells you what it does. You maintain the principal permanently forever, and you can spend what? You can spend the interest in that activity. Okay? Okay, that's it about the permanent fund. Now, we have our, our uh, proprietary funds. There are two of them, the internal service fund and the enterprise fund, right? Okay? And so what happens? When we look at these funds, we're back on full accrual accounting. So we will be having equipment. We'll be having depreciation. We'll be having long-term debt, right? And we'll get into these in more detail in Chapter 7. Okay. Now, when we look at the statement of net position, we use that difference approach. Assets minus liabilities equal net position. We do not add up the liabilities in the net position to report an amount that grosses up and matches the total amount of assets, right? Only the what? Only the general fund does that? Or the governmental funds, I should say, are the only ones that do that? Right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, here we were looking at this earlier, guys. There's our business type activities, water and sewer parking. Those are our enterprise funds. Governmental activities is our internal service fund, right? But we are at the proprietary fund level now. Okay. We have what? Current and non-current assets. Current and non-current liabilities. 
Okay. Now, when we break our, when we report our net position, we break it into three categories. Remember, for our governmental category fund balances, we had five, didn't we? We had five categories, non-spendable, and then we had the spendable ones, spendable, recal, restricted, committed, unassigned, and assigned. Uh, but it was assigned and unassigned to spell recal because we go, what, in order from hardest to spend to easiest. So it's restricted, committed, what, assigned and unassigned. Okay. Well, at the uh, for our proprietary funds, we only have three categories. Restricted means is, is restricted by some external contract with somebody, like the bonds, right? If it's unrestricted, that means we can spend it, however, within this, um, within this uh, proprietary fund. If it is net investing capital assets, net of related debt, what that means is we have, say, a building that we have uh, spent a million dollars on, but we have related debt of 500000 so we would report what? Net investing capital assets of 500000 right? Because assets minus liabilities equal net position. So that'll tie. Okay. Okay, good. Now, the way to remember these categories is by the mnemonic run. Restricted, unrestricted, and net investing capital assets. The mnemonic run. Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we look at our, I shouldn't have erased it. When we look at the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund, uh, and changes in uh, f fund net position for our income statement, notice, guys, we're using the commercial version, aren't we? That I wrote up on the board earlier that I shouldn't have erased. So we have operating revenue, we have operating expenses. Difference between operating revenue and operating expenses is our operating income. We then report our non-operating items. Example of non-operating items would include interest, gains and losses on sale of equipment, etc. Okay. Okay, good. Our change in net positions like net income. Net positions like retained earnings, right? Okay, good. Statement of cash flows is only prepared by the proprietary funds. It's only prepared by the proprietary funds. We'll jump more into the statement of cash flows in Chapter 7. We only prepare statement of cash flows out of the proprietary funds. The governmental funds, the fiduciary funds, the government-wide statements do not have a statement of cash flows. It is only the proprietary funds. They're the only ones that prepare a third statement. Everyone else, it's two statements, a balance sheet and an income statement, right? Okay. We'll get more into that in Chapter 7. Internal Service Fund, the S and C PAPI. This is what? Activities where we are providing services to other parts of the government, other departments in the government. Okay. Classic example is what? Motor pool. That's what that guy's doing. Changing the filter, oil filter in a red police car. Okay. Whatever it is he's doing. Okay. And what? Governmental activities is where we consolidate that at the government-wide level, right? Enterprise fund. An enterprise fund charges for use. Most of the en uh, individuals, entities using that are outside of the government, aren't they? Okay. And we set up an enterprise fund to cover the cost of that activity. So the charges are consistent with what we'll cover most of the costs. Now, that doesn't mean that an enterprise fund can't receive some tax money. They often do. But most of the charges are covered by what? Most of the costs, I should say, are covered by what? User charges. huh? So most of the bridges in the Bay Area are enterprise funds because they're covered by the tolls, right? Okay. Okay, good. Three statements. Okay, that big old three is just reminding you that there are three statements that are prepared out of my proprietary funds, um, which of which my, uh, yeah, my proprietary funds, of which my internal service fund and enterprise fund are, which is the statement of net position, which is like the balance sheet, statement of uh, revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position, which is like the income statement, and the statement of cash flows, which is like the statement of cash flows. Okay. Okay.
Don't forget that. They're the only ones that prepare that third statement. Okay, our fiduciary funds, four of them, custodial fund, investment trust fund, the private purpose trust fund, and the pension fund. Okay, these are... Um, these are funds in which the government keeps track of assets, liabilities, etc., that belong to other people, in which the government is the best place for those assets to be managed. For example, the pension fund of the government employees. Okay? So we come over, and when we report them, we use full accrual accounting. So they'll be capital assets, they'll be long term liabilities. Okay? On the income statement, our revenues are called additions. So additions are like revenues. Our expenses are called deductions. So our deductions are like our expenses. We call them additions. We call them deductions. Okay. The what? Fiduciary funds are not reported at the government-wide level, right? Now. We use the difference approach, don't we here? Assets minus liabilities equal net position. That's the same for everybody but who? These are the fiduciary funds. Assets minus liabilities equal net position. We use that difference approach. I always have trouble why my classes have so much trouble understanding this concept. You've been looking at balance sheets now for years in which they report the assets, the total of the assets. Then they take the liabilities and the stockholder's equity, add that together and report a bottom line that matches to the amount that shows for the assets, don't they? Okay. Governments only do that in one category of funds. What category is that? Huh? Well, it's the governmental funds. All of them do that. The general fund, the general fund, special purpose, special revenue fund, capital project fund, debt service fund, permanent fund. I guess I need to. Go back and show that again. I'm never sure why this is so much trouble. You're not the first ones. Okay. Here's the total assets, 5,616. Then I have the what? Then I have the total liabilities, 1,296. Right? I take the what? I take the total liabilities plus my fund balance, and that equals 5,616. Is that the same number? Okay. Only the governmental funds do that. Everybody else leaves you hanging right here at 4195 and doesn't add the liabilities to come up with a bottom line. Okay? Everyone else leaves you at the net position. So when you look at these statements for the um, for the proprietary funds, you should have an empty feeling at the bottom. But, but, but where's the total up of the net position and the liabilities? Where is it? They don't do it. Okay, that's the case of the government-wide level. That's the case for the proprietary funds. That's the case for what? For the fiduciary funds. Question? Okay. So... This is why I made a big deal out of it, because I knew this question was coming. The format of the presentation of statement of financial position for fiduciary funds adheres to the following equations, assets and deferred outflows minus liabilities and deferred inflow equal net position, doesn't it? Because we show the difference. And that would be the same for the government-wide, the same for the proprietary funds. It is not the same for the governmental funds. Okay? And so we give you some example what the fiduciary fund statements look like, assets. We will report things at fair value often in these funds because if we're holding investments and whatnot for the benefits of others, it makes sense to report those at fair value, right? Net position is shown as the difference. 
when we report the changes in fiduciary net position, our additions are like revenue. Notice revenues, which we call additions, include contributions from both the employee and the employer. These days, more and more public employees are being asked to contribute to their own pension. Okay. Then we have what? Different earnings from different investments. We don't put money in a mattress and hope that it grows so we can pay benefits. When we pay benefits, that is what? A deduction from these funds. Okay. We don't call it expense. We call it deduction, though. Okay, custodial funds, investment trust fund, private purpose trust fund, and the pension fund, guys. I'm going fast because we're going to get into the detail of these later. All I want you to know right now is this, which is what? What funds constitute our governmental funds? Which funds constitute our proprietary funds? What funds constitute our what? Our fiduciary funds. How are they consolidated up at the government-wide level? What type of accounting do we use? Everybody uses modified accrual. Ah! Everybody uses what? Full accrual, economic resources, and at the government-wide level, operational accountability. Only the what? Governmental funds use the modified accrual, the fiscal accountability, and the current financial resources measurement focus, right? We will have to perform the reconciliation, right? And I showed you what that looked like earlier. That's what that little arrow is about. I'm not going to do that again. You get that. We roll up the enterprise funds into business type activities. I'm not doing that again. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about major fund reporting. Okay. Now, what happens? Governments have hundreds of funds. They could have only, they'll only have one general fund. Is that what we say up here? Okay. They only have one major fund. Ah, one general fund. Only one general fund. But they could have 50 special revenue funds. It depends on what? What revenue we've collected for what purpose, right? They could have 20 capital project funds. It just depends on how many capital projects they have going on. They usually have one debt service fund, okay? But, um, you know, they could have two, three different permanent funds. They could have several enterprise funds. We've seen that, right? So what happens? If they were to put all of those funds on the face of their financial reports, all of a sudden their financial reports would no longer be understandable. Is it okay for financial reports to not be understandable? Is not okay. That's what FASB tells us. We want to be understandable, right? Gasby says the same thing. They need to be understandable. So what they tell us to do is identify the big funds. Find the big funds and put them on the face of the financial report. All the little funds that don't constitute a major fund, add them all together and report them under one column. Now, you may feel, well, wait a minute. What if I want to see that detail? Well, governments have the option. It's an option. Governments have the option of showing you combining schedules where they'll show you how everything rolls up to that one column that's shown on the face of the main financial statements. Okay? And I think when we were scrolling through the city of San Jose, remember there was combining schedule after combining schedule after combining schedule because they've got all those little funds that didn't meet the major fund test. Okay, so what we're going to understand here is how do we determine a major fund? And there are two tests that we perform to determine a major fund. There's a 10% test and a 5% test. Now, the general fund doesn't go through this test. It's always a major fund, right? So when we're looking for major governmental funds, major enterprise funds, we're going to apply that 10% and 5% test, right? to everybody but the general fund. Now, when we do this, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take different financial statement elements of all the general funds and we're going to add them together and we're going to multiply that number by 10% and any governmental fund 
other than the general fund, which it would pass the tests anyway. We're doing them for the other governmental funds. General fund automatically is, but it would pass anyway. We're going to look at those funds and we're going to see any fund that passed that 10% test, that first test. If they pass that first test, that 10% test, then we will move to the second test, the 5% test. And we'll do the general funds, the governmental funds, and the enterprise fund tests separately. We'll do the, uh, for the 10% test, for the 5% test, we will add the enterprise funds and the governmental funds together in order to see if they pass the 5% test. And if they pass both tests, then they are considered to be a major fund and will report on the face of the financial statements. If they fail either of those tests, then what? then they will be in one column rolled up and then if we want to we can report the detail as to those smaller funds. Now what financial statement items do we look at? Well we look at assets, we look at liabilities, we look at revenues, we look at expenditures. So what's left? Fund balance and net position is all that's left that constitute the elements of the financial statements. We do not perform the 10% test and the 5% test on fund balance. We do not report it on net position. Uh, we do not um, apply it to net position. Okay? All right. Now, you look at all this and you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Okay? So, what I did is I lifted from the textbook this example. And once you look at it, it's pretty easy to uh, understand. The only thing that I don't like about this example is you see how they've given us the 10% and the 5% columns. They've given that to us. So they've given us the 10% of all the governmental funds and then the 5% of the combination of the governmental and the enterprise funds, but they haven't shown us the detail as to how they got those numbers. So what they did was they took, for example, all the assets of all the governmental funds, added them together, multiply that by 10%, and that represents this 4,492,627. Then they took what? All of the governmental funds, all the enterprise funds, mushed them together, multiplied that number by 5%, and that's how they got this number, 4,082,141. Okay, they're not showing us the detail that constituted what they calculated here to be the 10% and the 5%. The other thing that makes this example not the best in the world, but it's okay, is that they don't show me the 10% of the enterprise funds, and they don't show me what? They don't show me the general fund in this calculation at all. So general fund would have been added in with the governmental funds, wouldn't it have, in order to calculate this 10% uh, number? Okay. So if I have 10% of the assets and I look at my fund and I want to see if the road fund is a major fund, it has to pass both tests, doesn't it? Okay. So when I look at the assets, I take what of the road fund? 1,369,238. I compare it to 10% of the governmental funds. Does it constitute 10%? It does not. It's less. So based on assets, the road fund right now is not a major fund. But then I move to the next line item, liabilities. And the liabilities of the road fund is 172,439. Did it pass the 10% test for liabilities? Yes, it did. So I moved to the 5% test, which includes both the governmental and the enterprise funds. And oops, it didn't pass that test. So it is not a major fund based on liabilities. But now I move to what? Now I move to revenues, don't I? And when I look at the revenues, revenues were 4289 10% of the revenue of the governmental funds didn't pass that test either, right? So then I look at what? Expenditures, 3986 I compare it to the 10%. Didn't pass that test either. Therefore, the road fund is not a major fund because it didn't pass what? the 10%, 5% test for any one of the financial statement line items. Notice fund balance is not included in here, right? Okay. All right, let's try the debt service fund. Debt service fund is 3,892,020. And did it pass for assets? Nope, didn't pass for assets. Let's try it for liabilities. 
didn't pass for liabilities. Let's try it for revenue. Yes, it passed the 10% test for revenue, and it passed what? 5% test for revenue. It is a major fund. Then I look at the capital project, and capital project fund does what? Passes it for assets, both at the 10% level and the 5% level. Capital project fund is a major fund, right? Okay. Question? Okay, so see this other governmental funds column? See that? All of those are the non-major funds. The ones that are reported, by the way, there's no reason HUD is red. All these other ones are what? Major funds? Now, when I sit here and I look at the net position here, or the to, I mean the total liabilities and deferred inflows, it's 359, isn't it, for the other column? And if a government wanted to, if a government wanted to, it could give you this detail as a combining schedule, right? And when we looked at the combining schedules, these are all the non-major funds. When we looked at those combining schedules, when we looked at um, the city of San Jose, remember they went on and on and on and on. And you can imagine why that would be so lengthy because there could be hundreds of non-major funds that didn't pass the 10% test, the 5% test, right? This is the one that screwed up. Remember I said there was a typo? And I haven't fixed it here yet. See how they're giving me the total assets here? See the total assets here? And then when you get to the total liabilities and fund balance it doesn't tie, that number has to tie. So there was a typo there, and I was telling somebody who came to my office, I've been teaching this class for five years, and I never noticed that that didn't tie before. So that uh, I'll fix this one too, and I'll post the corrected slides up. Okay. I think Tom was drinking that night. Okay. The mistake that he made is he subtracted the deferred inflow. You have to add the deferred inflow to the liabilities, right? And I got all ready to call him today to say, hey, you know, you made a mistake. And then I looked at the updated information, and he's already fixed that. Darn. I wanted to tell him he messed it up. Okay. okay. Capital assets, long-term liabilities, right, for our what? Proprietary fund, fiduciary funds, and government-wide? Not the governmental funds. This is the slide, guys, that gives you what? Gives you the measurement focus and the um, basis of accounting. See the stars? Okay, and then what? For the accountability, operational accountability at the government-wide level, fiscal accountability for my governmental funds. So I can kind of scribble those in in that other slide that I put all the stars on, but this sort of summarizes it right here. Okay, now we're down to the bottom box. Now we're talking about required supplemental information other than MD&A, right? And this information is going to be a little more detailed than what we see in the MDNA. MDNA, remember, was just things that were written, pros that were written. Okay. Example, the type of things that appear in the required supplemental information other than MDNA is budgetary comparison schedules, in which we will compare the budget to the actual. Now, if a government wants to, it can calculate a separate column that shows the variance. They don't have to do that. They do have to compare the budget to the actual, show that as part of the required supplemental information, but they don't have to calculate the variance. Calculation of the variance is optional. Okay? So you can see, and this is similar to what we saw when we looked at San Jose, we have the budget, 
we have the actual, we compare them. That's required. We must provide that. It's part of the required supplemental information, right? But that column that gives you the variance, that is optional. They don't have to calculate that variance right there. Okay. All right, good. Let's take a look at this exercise. Okay. And we're going to use one, two, or three to indicate if we think the information would be provided in the MDNA, if we think it would be part of the basic financial statements, or do we think it would be part of the required supplemental information other than MDNA? Okay. So let's just take a look at this one general fund statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. Part of my basic financial statements is my governmental fund income statement, isn't it? Okay, good. Disclosure of significant financial terms and conditions. Now you can see I've carried that, called that out as two because what? Because it's part of the notes, isn't it? Description of significant accounting policy is always like the first or second note you see in any set of financial statements, right? Number three, description of the city's application of the modified accrual basis, including the number of days. We're going to talk more about how we recognize revenue in Chapter 4. But descriptions of significant accounting policies, again, is a footnote type disclosure, right? Okay. Number three, uh, I mean number four, budget versus actual. We just looked at that. That's part of the required supplemental information other than MDNA, that would be a three, wouldn't it? We just looked at that? Okay. Number five, narrative analysis of significant variances. So you look and remember we said that the MDNA would be talking to you, writing to you about why there was the variance. The required supplemental information other than MDNA would be showing you that table, right? So the narrative that sort of explains, well, this is why we had to spend more money on public safety. There were raccoons chasing students around the campus or something. Jeez. I'd say that that's funny at San Francisco State. San Francisco State, you walk out of class this time of night, and there's a raccoon sitting, standing there, right? And so you think, oh, well, I'm not afraid of this raccoon. You try to do one of these, and the raccoon looks at you like, you want some of this? I mean, the raccoon... <laughs> So one time in my house in Castro Valley, the uh, raccoons were standing by the, my car. So I go and I want to get in my car, right? It's three rac four raccoons, two big ones, two little ones. And I'm like, uh, I come up to them, I go, ha! And they go, really? They know we're soft, right? So I have like this small bat that I like to run with in case I get, because I got chased by pit bulls. I got chased by pit bulls twice when I was running. One time I got chased by the pit bull and another dog of some mutt. And the guy that's driving sees what's happening, that these dogs aren't letting me go. I did the ha, and they ran away. And then they came back, and I went ha again. And they go, oh, we've seen that one. Okay, we're not scared anymore. So this guy sees what's happening so he starts driving his minivan towards the dogs to sort of get them off me and so I go around the other way and get into the back seat of his car <laughs> so now he's got this big sweaty Puerto Rican in the back of his car he's like where do you want to go I said out of here so he took me in far enough away so after that I started carrying a small bat right so then I have the raccoon so I go and I get the bat and I ping that bat on the ground ping ping they got that. They're like, okay, this monkey's upset. We better get the hell out of here. Okay, so anyway. So they say we had to spend more money on public safety because the raccoons were chasing people, right? So that would be described where you'd see the difference between the numbers, between the actual and the budget, and the required supplemental information other than MDNA. In the narrative, you'd understand that was because of raccoon abatement or whatever, right? Okay. Okay, good. Number six, capital assets associated with general government activities. That's a two. That's in the government-wide statements, isn't it? Okay. Don't be fooled by something like that thinking, well, no, we don't have any assets in our governmental funds. That's correct, but we do report them what? Governmental activities under the government on the government-wide level, right? Okay. And then statement of cash flows. The only funds that prepare statement of cash flows are our proprietary funds, right? But that's part of the basic financial statements. Okay? Okay, good.
So you want to go to jail or you want to go home? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. Here's what I'll do. I'll make a deal with you. Ready for the deal? Don't don't mess it up, guys, because I won't do it again if you if you don't if you don't do what I ask you. Okay? Which is you go through the quiz for chapter two, and then when we reconvene next week, we'll start with that quiz. But I expect a lively exchange back and forth because you've already looked at those questions. Don't sit there and expect me to read off the answers to you, because then I'm that's when Students start saying, we don't like Lord because, you know, his he did a 360 with his head because we didn't do the quiz that he asked us to. Okay, so do that quiz, all right? We'll, do, we'll go through it together, make sure we're on the same page for that, and then we'll jump into Chapter 4 next time, 4A. All right? Okay, guys, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. You're welcome.